Uh, and now for something completely different. And uh, tea will be in 17 minutes, Steph, OK? OK. Pointer. Squeezing value from seismic data or many bound bangs bounce back to deliver bucks from form, fabric, and fluids. The subtitle is inspired by the policy of the annual Lunar and Planetary Science Conference held in America, which encourages presenters to summarize their erudite papers in simple terms, and Japanese haiku poetry has become a favorite medium. Slide two. Squeezing value from seismic data can be a very esoteric process, but we can emphasize the notion of simplicity by comparison with other disciplines. Think of us studying Mother Earth as the medical profession studies bodies. My presentation will basically follow this format. It's going to be a short history of some seismic data, the components of seismic data, how we extract value, and I'm not talking about technical value, I'm talking about commercial value, and then a few concluding remarks, including the role of the Geological Society. Now, as is often the case with technological advances, it was war that led to the modern seismic industry. A hundred years ago, refraction seismic recordings were used during the First World War by both Allied and German forces to detect the positions of enemy artillery. There was certainly value in that seismic data. Reflection data, on the other hand, which now dominates exploration, arguably had earlier origins. Following the sinking of the Titanic, an experiment in 1914 used reflected sound waves to detect icebergs, for you, Julian, up to 12 miles away. The principles learned were then applied to the subsurface for onshore oil and gas exploration, yielding seismograms like this. Now, after three decades of working onshore, seismic exploration began to move offshore with vessels like this. And with the combination of early, the early digital revolution, it led to major improvements in data quality. Now, that word quality, what are the essential qualities of seismic data? To my mind, they are threefold. They are form, fabric, and fluid properties. Until the 1970s, seismic geophysicists were more or less limited to determining structural form. Drilling structural anomalies without much information on, lith on lithological fabric to back it up was the norm. Today, we still identify structural prospects using ever more revealing data. Sorry, we've got behind here. This didn't click. That's the one with no lithological data. So anyway, we're getting ever more revealing data, but the portfolio of opportunities for structural anomalies is diminishing. Fortunately, the development of digital data acquisition and processing in the 60s and 70s enabled the likes of Peter Vale, who, by the way, was the William Smith medalist in 1986, to develop the concept of seismic stratigraphy and thereby enable them to make educated guess, guesses about lithological fabric. Then, over the last 20 years, the opposite picture to Julian's here, the remarkable improvement in marine equipment and the increasing computing power has enabled seismic data to be collected in 3D volumes and to be sliced and diced and analyzed in terms of velocity and density information to make far more reliable predictions of lithology. Sometimes we can almost feel the rocks. But that is not all. It is now possible to predict to some degree porosity, fluid content, mechanical properties, and even pressure from the seismic signal. These parameters are broad, broadly grouped as rock properties. Now, as early as the 1970s, gas-liquid interfaces had been recognized on seismic data. But we can do even better now, even distinguishing between oil-water contacts. As you will probably realize, exploration in a new area where there is scant information often starts by using satellite imagery, outcrop, gravity, and magnetic data. 
However, it isn't long before seismic data comes into its own as the most effective tool for unlocking information on petroleum-bearing strata. As such, this powerful technology has played a major role in the worldwide discovery of about five trillion barrels of oil and gas equivalent. Of course, much of this has been produced to provide the bulk of energy that has fueled global development over the past hundred years. The world currently consumes almost 100 million barrels of oil per day. Even with the energy transition away from fossil fuels, the high energy density of petroleum and its specialist role in certain products means that it is probably not going to be replaced rapidly. For example, BP forecasts increasing oil use before a demand peak about 2040, and demand for gas will not peak until considerably later. Now, for the geoscientist who's working in the oil sector, the tar task is to use seismic data to find and define oil and gas deposits. But for that geoscientist management and the company's stakeholders, the ultimate aim is to create value and utility. This is achieved through a series of de-risking steps that are expressed by the internationally adopted Petroleum Resource Management System. For the investor, there are two categories of subsurface oil and gas, resources and reserves. Resources are higher risk and really fall in what I would call the hope category. In contrast, reserves have more materiality and are essentially those vo volumes which have been discovered and can be produced under prevailing technology and economic conditions to a readily available market. In other words, they are not stranded. It is important to understand that the type of investor changes with changing project maturity status as shown in this slide. Many startup exploration companies, and as been mentioned, I've been involved with four, rely literally on family and friends, i.e. those who are prepared to back nothing more than an idea. Once a company is established and rights to explore have been secured, there are two sources of investment. First are other exploration companies who wish to acquire an interest in a project in return for paying maybe a disproportion amount for exploration work. And then secondly, equity finance, which can be raised, and that involves selling part of the company to those who want to join in the adventure. For a company that has got established and has got to the stage of having contingent resources, that area in the middle of my diagram, where economic viability of a discovery is uncertain, a project might attract modest amounts of cash if that company can make a sufficiently persuasive pitch. And don't forget, I said, we all have to sell our ideas. In the case of reserves, there's a major shift in investor type. In addition to equity funding, third parties can be persuaded to make loans of various sorts. Though, of course, the no negotiations are likely to be tough. The key point for the investor is that since reserves are regarded as a tangible asset, they can be securitized. From the explorer's viewpoint, it is important that the assets can be entered onto the company's balance sheet and underpin its bankability and perhaps its share value. And here's a key point. As well as helping to locate oil and gas accumulations, another very important function of seismic data is to de-risk existing resources and reserves and lift them up through that table. So what are some of the ways that this is now being done? The hitherto classic stages of acquisition, processing, and interpretation of seismic are now beginning to be linked into a real-time continuum. This was barely imaginable 10 years ago. Some of the advances in the, in, in the interpretation realm to which I have been exposed include the development of RockDoc, a software package which has become a global industry platform for better predicting the nature of conventional reservoir rocks, 
their contained fluids and pressures. Then there is GIFI, a handy acronym for joint impedance and fasces inversion, and I have somebody in the audience who can explain that, <laughs> which is a new technique to better understand unconventional shale oil and shale gas reservoirs. It is also providing its worth for exploring conventional reservoirs where there is no nearby well control, giving more reliable correlations and predictions of fluid occurrence, as shown on this slide. And then there is 4D seismic, which involves acquiring sequential 3D surveys and detecting subtle changes in static and dynamic reservoir properties to, to identify where oil has been left behind by existing production wells. New wells can then be strategically placed to drain that oil. The nearly 50-year journey from 3D to 4D imaging includes an interesting anecdote about ICON's involvement in the 1990s. I was sitting at my desk, the phone rang, picked it up, found myself talking to a senior technologist at ESSO. And his opening line was, Peter, I think you need to go and see the Institute of Psychiatry. <laughs> now, I was somewhat flummoxed, of course, but needless to say, a small group of us went to the Institute of Psychiatry, which is in Denmark Hill, or at least it was in those days, in South London, and we exchanged ideas because they had exactly the same sort of problem as we were wrestling with. They were trying to map changes in brain activity with different types of mental disorder. So they would have a patient come in, let's say on a Friday, take a 3D image of the brain, do the same the following Friday, and so on. And of course, to get 4D and see change, they needed to compare each cube coming from each week's examination. But to do that, they had to make sure that they were comparing each specific voxel in space with the same one from the previous data set. And to do that, they were developing some algorithms which enabled them to flex the data statistically and get a best fit. And that is exactly what we were trying to do with 4D seismic surveys in the North Sea. And as a result of that, a project was set up, it was alluded to earlier, funded by some majors, and they're followed from that an interchange of technology from the unlikely place of the Institute of Psychiatry and the oil industry. And we move on, and that is now the kind of imagery that one is seeing in the medical world, and it is quite startling, I think. So what next? Disparate data sets at all scales can now be analyzed through systems like ICON's Theseus program to reveal new correlations. <coughs> Organizations in many different industries are pursuing this realm of big data. And artificial, or should it really be called augmented, intelligence. This is to some degree an automation of Wallace Pratt's famous 1952 dictum where oil is first found in the final analysis is in the minds of men. So it's not surprising that the likes of Amazon, Google, and Microsoft are becoming involved in the petroleum sector to apply the data crunching algorithms that they have been developing over the last few years. So not only can the petroleum industry learn from the medical and other long established professions, but also from the world of social media. Now who'd have believed that? As I have implied, exploration companies need funds to acquire seismic data. They can generate them internally, or perhaps come, it comes from existing shareholders. Alternatively, funding may be from banks or private equity institutions who manage a portfolio of investments, possibly including your pension, what I call the city community. Whilst a few within that community will understand some of the nuances of seismic data interpretation and the associated pitfalls, most will have no competence to judge a plausible interpretation from an implausible one. This knowledge gap needs to be closed as much as possible to ensure the most efficient deployment of capital, wherever it comes from. 
and that's where the Geological Society comes in, with its City of London Geoscience Forum and other parts of its outreach program, which amongst other things makes those who control the funds we would like aware of the expertise that resides here within the fellowship and the role we play in wealth creation, just as did my hero, William Smith, 200 years ago. My profuse thanks must go to those acknowledged here and to you for listening. Thank you. One question, as Peter was so brief in getting us towards tea. Graham. Obviously, you're aware that the society puts a great store by its chartership status. Do you have any sense as whether that is a qualification that the city puts any store by? I suspect it does. I haven't asked the question. I haven't asked the question, Graham. Um, but it's something that actually, it's a good point, which I will make a point of introducing to conversations. Yeah. <laughs>